If you meet Buddha on the road, kill him. If you meet Buddha in an antique store, buy him. The latter is about attachment, the former non-attachment. I started a new book, Jacques Rabot's The Great Fire of London. I found the book at a bookstore near Columbia University years ago, when I used to roam the city in my free time before kids. The book was an attempt to write an historical account of the fire that accidentally turned into a memoir of Rabot's failed attempt at completing it. At the time, I was reading a lot about London. Ellie and I had traveled there twice years previously, and I became interested in the country's long history from empire to comfortable post-empire, a progression the United States is sure to follow as we are not immune or exempt from being knocked off the top of the hill. American egotism is flagrant and syntonic. The book sat on my shelf for a decade. This week I pick it up again, my ego more dystonic these days. I learned that Rabot was part of a French writing movement called the Lippo, which is loosely translated as Workshop of Potential Literature. The group exercised self-imposed constraints to break from comfortable patterns and structures. One exercise called N plus 7 takes a text and replaces every noun with the seventh word after it in the dictionary. The Second Amendment of the United States Constitution reads, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. N plus 7 reads, a well-regulated miller, bell necessary to the seedbed of a free statistic, the right of the perch to keep and beat her armholes, shall not be infringed. Am I looking for distraction or conviction? David Bowie died last night. I think about my own mortality. At 45, I am a short 24 years from 69, the age of Bowie when he died. There is something about Bowie's death that resonates with me. Perhaps it is that he was never a has-been. He was never carted out for some hoary money-making venture. There was always relevancy to his work. He seemed forever young. Am I making the most of my time? I came of age in the 80s and first saw Bowie on MTV. Let's Dance, Modern Love, and China Girl were in heavy rotation during the early years of MTV when music video was still a burgeoning art form. Bowie mastered it. Put on your red shoes and dance the blues. I had a snarky friend who used to sing China Girl to me, but instead of girl, he replaced it with boy, my little China boy, a pubescent alto to tenor voice cracking through the flare of Bunsen burners in Miss Erlinger's science class. Who cares that I was half Japanese? Oriental was Oriental. There was no distinction. Adolescence in the 80s was a testing ground for patriarchy and white power, young boys trying to figure out their masculinity and identity in an unchecked, vicious ritual. Teachers rarely got involved in the racial rituals of students. There might be a cut it out or breaking up of a physical fight, but race was not addressed in any constructive way. I had Jewish friends, Asian friends, and a Chilean friend. I didn't differentiate white friends because they were normative and had no racial category in my mind. I tried to fit into their world of blonde hair, blue eyes, 
Anglo-Saxon names and popularity. The white kids seemingly had it all. At dusk, I wait for my kids' school bus. I used to watch the sunset from the sunroom. Backs of houses and electrical wires obstructed the view. Dusky orange smoldered between the patchwork of tree branches. I could see the flickering streetlights on the busy boulevard beyond the purple offing. My mother cooked pots boiling on the stove. My sister played in the living room or watched TV with me. We waited for my father to get home from work before we sat down to eat. We had a black and white Zenith TV. I used to stand at the channel clicking through stations. Two, fuzz, four, five, fuzz, seven, fuzz, nine, fuzz, 11, fuzz, 13, UHF. I watched a lot of TV. I love Lucy, the Partridge Family, the Brady Bunch, Leave It to Beaver, My Three Sons, Tom and Jerry, The Friends, Friends Schoolhouse Rock, Rock Scooby-Doo, Super Friends, Hong Kong Fooey, The Amazing Race, Davy and Goliath, The Courtship of Eddie's Father, The Price is Right, Match Game, Card Sharks, Hollywood Squares, Family Feud, The Gong Show, The Joker's Wild, Tic-Tac-Toe, The Newlywed Game, Name That Tune, Let's Make a Deal, The Wizard of Oz, March of the Wooden Soldiers, Peanuts, Holiday Specials, Frosty the Snowman. Frosty the Snowman was a jolly happy soul with a corn cob pipe and a button nose and two eyes made of coal. Frosty the Snowman is a fairy tale, they say. He was made of snow, but the children know he came to life one day. There must have been some magic in that old silk hat they found, for when they placed it on his head, he began to dance around. Frosty the Snowman was alive as he could be, and the children say he could laugh and play just the same as you and me. Our house was on the corner of Barbie Trode and Orchard Street, a block up from Port Washington Boulevard. I was always drawn to the boulevard. I used to draw intricate town scenes, stores, cars, details and windows, and people going about their day. I used to play with matchbox cars in a friend's gravel driveway up the street. For days on end, we would scrape the gravel clear with plastic punch-outs from the handles of plastic milk containers. His family had weekly milk deliveries that were dropped on his porch in a metal cooler. We created roads in a town. This is the hospital, post office, supermarket, police station, school. We lived in the park section, a middle class neighborhood where houses were built close together. Many of the homes had front porches. My father worked for Japan Airlines. My mom was a stay at home mother. They bought a house in the park section of Port Washington in 1973. It is a small quarter-mile grouping of houses right off Port Washington Boulevard. The town, once established on family-owned businesses, now has the latest chains. The character of Port Washington is much different these days. Residents who live there for decades are staunchly middle class. As taxes increase, older people downsize and young professionals buy starter homes. Old floor plans are gutted for open space concepts. As a child, I heard stories that there were only a few houses in the park section at the turn of the century. There was an unobstructed view down to Manhasset Bay. Some 19th century houses closer to the bay had widow's walks, and other houses were positioned sideways, front doors facing the sides of newer homes built around them. Miss James, an octogenarian woman who lived in the first house on my street, right behind the local Carvel, remembered open grassy fields straight up to Woodlawn Avenue in the sand pits. 
As modest homes were built, the view slowly gave way to the hopperesque proximity of the neighbors' private lives. Stone chimneys grew TV antennas, roof satellite dishes like plants looked for sunlight. Bar Beach Road was busy. Jane Jacobs believed that a safe neighborhood had eyes watching throughout the day. Stay-at-home moms, retirees watering the lawn, teenagers back and forth to school. The mailman, a paper boy, milk deliveries, and commuters returning from the station. The park section was a 10 minute walk to the Long Island Railroad Station, which appealed to yuppie commuters. My house was a block from Flower Hill Elementary, Weber Junior High, and Schreiber High School, which also appealed to yuppie commuters. I was an outdoor kid, spring, summer, fall, and winter. I was allowed to explore the neighborhood on foot or on my Schwinn bike with a banana seat. While there were the occasional headlines of kidnappings and missing children plastered on milk cartons, parents generally felt safe letting their children play unattended. There was no media-fed paranoia of lurking pedophiles. We played baseball on the cement street with makeshift bases, manhole cover, fire hydrant, extra mitt. It feels a lot different sliding into a manhole cover in jeans and hush puppies rather than on a Game Boy. Summers were some of my fondest memories as a child. I'd leave the house in the morning, check in for a sandwich, and be out the door again until my mother called me in for dinner. My friends and I were sweaty, mosquito-bitten, tanned, and full of stories. Our bikes took us to places that our parents would never let us go. We used to ride miles away from home. The town dock was a favorite destination. We would sidle up to men drinking beer and peek into their buckets to see what they caught. Some of the men had two or three buckets full of flipping snappers. I loved watching them cast their lines far out into the bay, the rapid zip of the line, and the casual click of the reel in. Some of the drunken men cursed and talked about dirty subjects, and we listened with curious glee. I loved the smell of the docks, the salty air, the cool breeze, the aroma of seafood from Louie's and Jimmy's backyard. On special occasions, my parents would take my sister and I to Louie's for dinner and I would order oysters on the half shell and fried clams. I thought it was so elegant that they gave us dinner rolls with butter. This is how rich people eat every day, I thought. Park section is a grid, four streets by four streets. Bogart is not part of the park section, but I include it because it was a major street I frequented during childhood. At the bottom of Bogart Avenue was an Exxon station where I filled my tire with free air. The College Point Savings Bank, now Chase, was across the street. The bank parking lot was smoothly paved. We used to coast down the hill on our bikes and turn into the empty bank parking lot, riding in circles like an eddy. As I got older, I was inspired by the French flaneur, which means to stroll. Edmund White, author of the flaneur, describes one as a stroller, a loiterer, someone who ambles through a city without apparent purpose, but is secretly attuned to the history of the place in a covert search for adventure, aesthetic, or erotic. One of the most famous flaneurs was the poet Charles Baudelaire, who was sometimes accused of being the more superficial dandy for his concerns with physical appearances and all the leisurely activities of the bourgeois aristocrat. <laughs> Edmund White describes the more attuned stroll of the flaneur. The crowd is his domain, as the air is that of the bird or the sea of the fish. His passion and creed is to wed the crowd. For the perfect flaneur, for the passionate observer, it's an immense pleasure to take up residence in multiplicity, in whatever is seething, moving, evanescent, and infinite. You are not at home, but you feel at home everywhere. You see everyone. You are at the center of everything, yet you remain hidden from everybody. These are just a few of the minor pleasures of those independent, passionate, impartial minds 
whom language can only awkwardly define. The observer is a prince who, wearing a disguise, takes pleasure in everywhere. The amateur of life enters into the crowd as into an immense reservoir of, of electricity. Old Grand Union, located on Port Washington Boulevard at Revere Road, closed in the mid-80s and was broken up into several smaller businesses. I still refer to it as the Old Grand Union because a new Grand Union opened up on Shore Road shortly after. The new Grand Union has since been replaced by a big shopping center with a stop and shop the size of a football field. It is on the site where the old Lilco Long Island Lighting Company building had stored natural gas in large light blue tanks. The light blue gas tanks were behind the Art Deco office building. Lipa bought Lilco in 1998. Today, the gas tanks are gone and replaced by a parking lot with saplings, plantings, and wood chips. My mother shopped at Grand Union, which is at the bottom of Revere Road. We would walk along Orchard Street, turn right on Revere, and then cut a worn-out dirt path down a hill into the tremendous parking lot. Old beer cans and candy wrappers were suspended in the high brush. It was a jumping off site for kids on dirt bikes before state regulated helmet laws and jackass the movie. Grand Union had a loose candy bin in the back where you could buy Brock's candy by the pound. Once my sister and I entered the store, we would gravitate right to the bin. The manager of the store was named Wolfgang. It means traveling wolf in German. I would stare at his picture on the office door and think, what a strange name. Years later, in my early 20s, I was in a supermarket where the manager's name was Fran Solo. I began to steal packs of gum from the candy rack near the cash register and distribute pieces of gum in exchange for borrowing a kid's first baseman's mitt or for a ride on a red line or mongoose. Mongooses and red lines were the best dirt bikes. Rampar was okay and Schwinn sucked. I got a Schwinn one Christmas, but it didn't have the cool front fork or chunky red line neck, heavy duty spokes, or the thick pads for the crossbar neck and I would frame. go to the Schwinn shop on Port Boulevard and stare at the expensive accessories in the glass case. Only the kids from Beacon Hill and Sands Point got the mongooses and red lines. The stealing was short lived because my mom caught me handing out gum to kids on my block. It was an impulsive behavior and could easily be classified as a conduct disorder. My kindergarten teacher told my mom, Akira is just here to play. She thought I exhibited attention deficits and could not focus on required schoolwork. In the late 70s, the second diagnostical statistical manual, DSM-2, called today's cluster of ADHD symptoms, hyperkinetic reaction to childhood. The disorder included overactivity, restlessness, distractibility, and a short attention span. The disorder was said to diminish in symptoms by adolescence. I think I acted out so kids would like me. Gum was currency to kids. As an adult, I think I was attention seeking to get my parents to notice me. People pleasing is a term I would hear a lot about in therapy as an adult. My parents were not purposefully neglectful, but they were often preoccupied. It was also the 70s, so parenting standards were much different compared to the over-involved parents of today. My mother came from money and was raised in a household with an abusive alcoholic. My grandfather was often self-absorbed with his own needs, whether it was drink or women. He also had an attitude of wealth and therefore could do whatever he wanted when he wanted. Underneath it all, he was a sad, angry man. My mother did her best to raise my sister and me. She loved us and we felt it. She shielded us from her family's profligate past. My father was a child survivor of World War II. He knew hunger and existential threat at a young age. An aloof and socially distant man, he carried this trauma, but was too concerned with appearances, saving face, to explore his childhood and mental health. As a child, I did a song and dance to get their attention. The edges of the parking lot were dark and overgrown. Empty truck trailers sat for years and abandoned VW became enveloped by branches and weeds. Cops idled in squad cars listening to intermittent static and dispatch. Teens drinking at the football field or fight at the local bar, noisy neighbors. 
a rare felony was handled by the Nassau County Police. Grand Union was in decline. It always seemed empty, dried spills, flies on lettuce, low stock, sort of like bow hacks down the street. A lot of the old supermarkets were closing. The A&P became a Genovese store a few years earlier. Bohack soon became a key food, then meat farms, then under proper management, a fresh fruit and vegetable market, and today, an expensive gourmet supermarket with imported IPAs and stinky cheeses. King Cullen relocated to the site of Bay Bowl and upgraded. The CD 70s were ending and the town was attracting more residents with money and demands. Supermarkets became places to buy lawn furniture and auto parts. The Memorial Day Parade always congregated in the Grand Union parking lot. School bands, Girl Scouts, Brownies, Cub Scouts, Boy Scouts, Veterans of 20th Century Wars, Masonic Lodge, Elks Club, Polish, Irish, Italian organizations, sports teams, local dignitaries, all people sunken in in convertibles, and fire trucks at the end. I marched as a Cub Scout and a soccer player for several years. The route went down Port Washington Boulevard, left on Main Street, and ended in the St. Stephen's Church, where my parents were married in the late 60s. As we walked back up Main Street, my friends and I enjoyed watching the rest of the parade. American flags waved, veterans saluted, and families cheered. I loved America through the eyes of assimilation. I could participate in the Memorial Day Parade as long as I followed the script. Town parades were a certain kind of democracy that you had to ascribe to. It's like standing for the national anthem at sporting events. I've been conditioned since childhood to stand for the Star Spangled Banner or the Pledge of Allegiance at the start of class. Sometimes I silently sing the poetic words. Other times I listen to see if the singer can hit the high notes. Our country embeds our daily experiences with military devotion. In the case of the Pledge of Allegiance, God is added as well. The presumptuous God Bless America is often sung during baseball games around the country. I am increasingly feeling complicit in the military-industrial complex. Across the street from the Grand Union was the Nassau Knoll Cemetery. I remember two USPS mailboxes in front, one local, one out of town, that had long mail slots so cars could pull up. They were removed as traffic increased and the shoulder space was needed to accommodate turning lanes. The cemetery was a palatial green space surrounded by the backs of split-level homes the Long Island Railroad tracks, a reservoir canal, and Latham Brothers lumber yard. The working class and two-family homes on Beechwood Avenue seemed to be a forgotten street between busy Willowdale Avenue and the brick wall of the cemetery. Unless you had a reason to go to Beechwood Avenue, you didn't. Older kids on my block would brag to each other that they bought Chinese fried rice and would sit on the wall of the cemetery watching the cars go by. Like Matt Dillon and Over the Edge, Teens of the 70s, like most generations, were misunderstood and considered a problem for society. Suburban kids were portrayed as bored menaces, disillusioned with privilege and prosperity, the underbelly of paradise. In a 1980 review of the film by critic Roger Ebert, he said, Over the Edge is a funeral service held at the graveside of the suburban dream. To me, the older kids were to be looked up to because they could buy Chinese fried rice without their parents. That was an adult purchase, over my budget of $2 per week. Baseball cards, gum, and video games were all I could afford. The back of the cemetery had acres of unused land for future plots, with high dirt piles from fresh graves next to tractors and digging equipment. High school kids drank on the dirt piles and threw their cans in the reservoir canal. There was a noticeable brick tower with a white cupola that had an atrium and glass boxes for urns and family memorabilia. The cemetery sold an array of crematory accessories to hold the dust of our relatives' bones and flesh. Many of the Port Washington Clamdigger families are buried here. Some of these families, the Baymen, were interred in the Free Church Cemetery near the Mill Pond and then moved to the Nassau Knoll Cemetery during the turn of the century. I find cemeteries to be a state of exception. We bury our dead so we can remember them for a finite amount of time. Cemeteries have an expiration date. They crumble and crack and are forgotten. Lichen and moss embalm them. Future municipalities fence them off as historic places but don't know what to do with them. The Montfort Lot Cemetery behind the Port Washington Post Office is such an example. 
It's on the National Registry of Historic Places and it is maintained by the town of North Hempstead. Port Washington residents were buried there between 1737 and 1892. Still, it has been fenced off since I was a child. Historical preservation is political in a country built on white supremacy. Holden Caulfield said it best, when you're dead, they really fix you up. I hope to hell when I die, somebody has the sense enough to just dump me in the river or something. Anything except sticking me in a goddamn cemetery. People coming and putting a bunch of flowers on your stomach on Sunday and all that crap. Who wants flowers when you're dead? Leaving Port Washington Nobody. by train, you saw the ugly refuse behind auto repairs and metal shops. Rusted parts, engines, sheet metal, skeletons of awnings, styrofoam coffee cups left by Long Island Railroad track workers. Small huddled houses with Betty Boop facades hide metal clotheslines, blue kiddie pools, tires, and a mossy basketball. Under the Willowdale Bridge, graffiti tags, remnants of drinking and smoking, a disheveled plaid sleeping bag, used condoms. Through the rusty fence of the cemetery, you see the occasional grave stand out, adorned with colorful flowers, brown bouquets stained gravestones. The sound of caged dogs can be heard from the county shelter where the unclaimed canines are euthanized.